In the mid-19th century, a gripping saga unfolded across the vast landscapes of the American West. A tale etched in history as the Snake War from 1864 to 1868. This was no ordinary conflict. It was an irregular war waged by the United States of America against the elusive Snake Indians, a moniker assigned by settlers to the Northern Paiute, Bannock, and the Western Shoshone bands residing along the serpentine bends of the Snake River. The battlegrounds sprawled across the rugged states of Oregon, Nevada, and California, as well as the untamed expanses of the Idaho Territory. The toll of this tumultuous struggle was marked by a grim count of 1,762 casualties, fallen soldiers, wounded warriors, and captives, all bearing witness to the relentless clash between two worlds. The roots of this conflict burrowed deep into the soil of increasing tension between native tribes and settlers encroaching on ancestral lands. A narrative unfolded over several years where explorers passing through were trying to have minimal impact or maybe uh, massive impact, but the brewing storm actually reached a crescendo in August of 1851. In the warm August of 1851, beneath the expansive skies of Oregon Trail, a tale unfolded that would etch its mark on the rugged landscapes near the confluence of the Raft River and Snake River in present-day Idaho. It was a story of clash and tragedy where the destinies of Thomas Clark, an Englishman with a passion for hunting, and Cho Cho Ko, or Choo Choo Ko, a 20-year-old veteran guerrilla fighter uh, from the Shoshone intersected in a fateful counter. Thomas Clark, having journeying overland of the Williamette Valley in Oregon in 1848, partnered with fellow adventurer Jackson Vandervert and others in the California Gold Rush. Their gains were reinvested in high-quality cattle and horse destined for Oregon. By the spring of 1851, Clark, accompanied by his family and several Illinois pioneers, embarked on a journey westward. As they traversed the expansive landscapes, their wagon train, laden with dreams and possessions, became a slow-moving entity, allowing the animals to graze and thrive. Clark's family, including his mother, his sister Grace, and brothers, made the pil pilgrimage with him. Grace, at 25, drove a first-class hack designed for her and Clark, possibly the first of its kind traversing these kind of plains. Meanwhile, Cho Cho Ko, um, a seasoned warrior with the Shoshone tribe, found himself in a challenging situation. Short on supplies, particularly good horses, guns, and ammunition, Cho Cho Ko journeyed eastward along the Oregon Trail to meet his uncle, Deerfly, seeking reinforcements. On Wednesday of August 6th of 1851, the wheels of destiny turned. The wagon train halted by the Raft River for a noonday rest. Miss Clark, Grace, and Hodginson, a 17-year-old brother, drove ahead to prepare lunch. Thomas Clark, with hunting on his mind, meandered up the river in pursuit of ducks. Little did they know the shadows of adversity were gathering. The attackers under Cho Cho Ko's leadership devised a cunning strategy. Some warriors charged the main body of the wagon train at full gallop, inducing chaos, while others, including Cho Cho Ko, set their sights on the prized possessions, the horses. Amid the unfolding drama, Hodgkin Clark, eager to defend, climbed a wagon wheel but fell victim to a fatal shot. Miss Clark, confronted by a Shoshone man, resisted only to face gunfire. Grace uh, shielded her mother and was wounded in the wrist, the pain echoing through both of their lives. In the chaos, Grace, wounded and feigning death, witnessed the warrior's actions. Her clothes were torn and her body scarred. She escaped further harm as a dusk cloud heralded the return of Thomas Clark with his hunting hounds. Thomas Clark, rushing back at full speed, spurred the warriors into desperate act. Mistaking him for a vanguard of a larger party, they threw Grace down a bluff, leaving her with physical and emotional scars that would, she would endure for the rest of her life. The main body of the wagon train stood paralyzed, their initial shock preventing swift action. Charles Clark, Thomas's brother, organized a pursuit, but Cho Cho Ko's band found refuge in, nat in a natural fortress, evading capture. Some stolen horses would later resurface in Salt Lake City, weaving a thread of suspicion around the involvement of the raiders. When word of the Clark massacre reached the masses, a series of retaliations begun, specifically and most notably, a retaliation by a man named Ben Wright, when he organized a coalition of miners to respond to that attack. 
His group marched on a Modoc village near Black Bluff in Oregon and killed 41 native Modocs. Similar acts of violence and retribution paved the way for the impending Snake War, in a conflict that hung like a dark cloud over the horizon. In August of 1854, the Snake River had become a theater of tragedy as native attacks on pioneer trains reached its climax. The Ward Massacre, 21 people killed abruptly. Because of that, and the attacks on the Modoc Village and the Clark Massacre, the U.S. Army launched the punitive Awinas Expedition and it made a turning point of the relentless struggle for dominance. As the years unfurled, echoes of the Spokane War resonated and the U.S. Army became the custodian of migration to Oregon. Escorts like silent guards were dispatched each spring from 1858. Yet, the relentless tension persisted, especially for straggling groups like the ill-fated Myers Party, meaning their demise in the Salmon Falls Massacre of 1860, and that actually claimed 29 lives. As federal troops withdrew in 1861 to confront the upheavals of the American Civil War, the torch was passed to the California Volunteers. Subsequently, the 1st Washington Territory Infantry Regiment and the 1st Oregon Cavalry replaced Army exports on the immigration trails, a shifting of the guard against the ever-encroaching shadows of conflict. Amidst the turmoil, a visual journey reveals the Nez Pierce Reservation in Idaho, a testament to the geographical chessboard where tribes and settlers played their moves. The landscape echoed the silent resistance of Western Shoshone, Paiute, and other local Indians against the relentless encroachment, a resistance that would soon be known as the Snake War. Yet, the tendrils of conflict extended beyond territorial disputes. As gold mining waned in California in the late 1850s, a new wave of prospectors sought their fortunes venturing north and eastward up into the upper Great Basin and the Snake River Valley. A desperate competition for resources ensued, fueling violent uh, bloodshed on both sides as miners consumed more game and water and that dug into the Native American lands. In the fall of 1862, a series of gripping events unfolded, setting the stage for a fateful clash between Bear Hunter and Colonel Connor. This saga emerged against the backdrop against sweeping struggles between indigenous peoples and the American settlers that echoed across the vast expanse of the American West of the Mississippi. We've kind of been building up to this point here, so you're seeing the causes of these battles, the why people are fighting, and now we're getting into sparking the war. So while the nation's gaze remained uh, fixed on the eastern states embroiled in the Civil War, these incidents unfolded near uh, the boundary of Washington and Utah territories, adding to the complexity of the country. In the shadow of these broader conflicts, a narrative unfolded in this region near Summit Creek, which is now Smithville, when a horse mysteriously vanished, sparking an accusation against a young Shoshone named Pugweenie. The subsequent trial and hanging of this man set off a chain reaction as the Shoshone retaliated, claiming lives of settlers in the Merrill family. Meanwhile, the echoes of the gruesome massacre near Fort Hall in 1859 resonated through the region. A settler company from Michigan, journeying along the Oregon Trail, fell prey at night uh, by presumed local Shoshone. The survivors, hiding along the uh, Port Neuf River, bore witness to the brutal aftermath with Lieutenant Livingston's dragoons encountering a scene of unimaginable horror. A young girl mutilated and left to walk on her stumps, symbolizing the depths of the tragedy. Fast forward to 1860, and the Oregon Trail had become a battlefield in the infamous Battle of the Providence. Elijah Utter and his migrant party faced a deadly assault by Bannock and Boise Shoshone, resulting in a significant loss of life. Reuben Van Ornum, a missing young boy, became the focal point of a quest for justice. His uncle, Zacchaeus Van Ornum, sought assistance from Colonel Connor at Fort Douglas, triggering a dramatic uh, expedition to Cache Valley. The confrontation with Chief Bear Hunter and the subsequent skirmish in the Providence Canyon underscored the tensions that would come to head. As the winter of 1862 approached, Connor dispatched Major Edward McGarry on an expedition to recover stolen livestock, further escalating hostilities. 
the Bear River crossing witnessed a dramatic episode when Shoshone breaking camp, fleeing and advancing army troops and executing captives. The Deseret News expressed concern about the potential fallout from the executions, highlighting a delicate balance between settlers and Shoshone. The Montana Trail became another theater of conflict when Shoshone warriors seeking vengeance for past actions. A series of attacks on miners culminated in a final catalyst from Connor's expedition, a Shoshone assault on a group of eight miners near Franklin. As the survivors reached Salt Lake City, Chief Justice John F. Kinney, not Kennedy, Kinney, um, issued warrants to uh, arrest Shoshone chiefs, setting the stage for a military response. As soldiers from Fort Douglas prepared for a formidable expedition northward to confront the Shoshone, Colonel Connor had designed a plan. Keen on a surprise assault, he divided his command into detachments, ensuring that they met at strategic intervals during their journey at the Cache Valley. The response to Connor's military campaign echoed across diverse sentiments. George A. Smith, chronicling in the journal History of the LDS Church, hinted at skepticism, fearing the expedition might result in catching friendly Indians, leaving the guilty untouched. On the contrary, the Deseret News, in an editorial, expressed hope for the eradication of hostile parties, applauding Connor's potential success. The initial departure from Fort Douglas witnessed the first group, led by Captain Samuel W. Hoyt, departing on January 22nd of 1863. Following closely was a second group, consisting of 220 cavalry personnel, led by uh, Colonel Connor himself, setting out on January 25th. Armed with a substantial ammunition stockpile and aided by the cover of darkness, the soldiers embarked on a journey shrouded in secrecy. Upon nearing the town of Franklin, Captain Hoyt's infantry encountered a moment when Shoshone sought sustenance from settlers. Say that three times, Shoshone sought sustenance from settlers. <laughs> the soldiers' unexpected uh, arrival prompted a swift retreat by the Shoshone, leaving, uh, leaving sacks of grain behind. This encounter set the stage for the impending conflict. Connor orchestrated the convergence of his forces, aiming for a surprise dawn attack on January 29th. The cold Utah winter added a layer of adversity, with whiskey rations freezing solid and soldiers grappling with frostbite. The Shoshone, meanwhile, gathering food from Mormon settlers, aware of the looming confrontation but anticipating a negotiation rather than direct military engagement. The morning of the 29th unfurled a brutal confrontation, marking one of the coldest times in the Cache Valley. Connor's initial frontal assault faced fierce resistance, leading to a temporary retreat. Subsequent flanking maneuvers and a relentless offensive forced the Shoshone into a dire situation where they actually ran out of ammunition. As the battle unfolded, Chief Sadwich, uh, sensing the impending clash, observed, quote, maybe that's them soldiers they were talking about. The Shoshone chiefs anticipating negotiation were taken aback by the ferocity of the attack. The battlefield witnessed a tragic chapter, with Bear Hunter, a prominent chief that we talked about in the beginning, meeting his end. The aftermath revealed a stark disparity in casualty counts, with the California volunteers sustaining losses and the Shoshone enduring a devastating toll. Survivors, including Chief Sadwich, navigated the harsh reality of the aftermath, striving to rebuild his shattered community. The echoes of the Bear River Massacre resonated as the concluding chapter of the Shoshone Nation's significant influence on the Cache Valley and its realms. Beyond the immediate ramifications, the conflict unfolded as a pivotal moment, facilitating the expansion of Mormon settlements into the northern reaches of Cache Valley and becoming a springboard for further ventures into southeastern Idaho. Cache Valley, once the contested terrain, now bore witness to the unfolding of a new chapter in its history. The friction between the Mormons and Colonel Connor persisted, weaving a narrative of accusations and criticism that reverberated for years. Allegations of harassment against non-Mormons in the Utah Territory and Connor's ambitious endeavors to initiate a mining industry in Utah fueled an ongoing discord. In the aftermath, 
Chief Sadwich, and his band forged an alliance with the Mormons, a surprising turn of events that saw many members baptized and embracing the teachings of the LDS Church. Sadwich, elevated to the status of an elder uh, in priesthood, played a central role in the establishment of the Washakie or Washakai, Utah, a town named in honor of the Shoshone chief. The Northwestern Band members, under the sponsorship of the LDS Church, embarked on the journey of building farms and homesteads, paving the way for their integration into mainstream LDS society. Those Shoshone who did not partake in the settlement found their way to the Fort Hall Indian Reservation or the Wind River Indian Reservation, charting distinct paths in the aftermath of conflict. Meanwhile, the arrival of Colonel Connor and the California Volunteers at Fort Douglas and their reception in the California community portrayed them as heroes. Published newspaper articles celebrated their exploits, depicting Connor's promotion to the permanent rank of Brigadier General. Shortly thereafter, he received a brevet promotion to the rank of Major General, an accolade that underscored his leadership during the Bear River Massacre. Connor's campaign against the Native Americans persisted through the remainder of the U.S. Civil War, leading the Powder River Expedition against the Sioux and Cheyenne, etching his name further into the history of Western conflict. The legacy of the Bear River Massacre, with its complex interplay of alliances, settlements, and social integrations, left a mark on the Cache Valley history. So what comes next? How does it end? The stage is set in 1866, amidst the turbulent currents of the Snake River War, uh, for a defining moment, which is the Battle of the Owyhee River. Earlier that year, the Owyhee River had borne witness to relentless assaults by the Paiute, setting the scene for a clash that would resonate through the history of the Cache Valley. At first light of December 26, General Crook's forces stealthily closed in on an unsuspecting Paiute camp. The element of surprise played its hand as the initial shot shattered the stillness of the morning. Chief Howluck, undeterred, chose defiance and met the soldiers in battle. Taunts from the indigenous warriors were met with a precision and force that left little room for mockery. The swift exchange of gunfire saw the mounted warriors swiftly incapacitated, with the remaining few seeking refuge behind rocky fortifications until noon. When a tactical withdrawal was the only recourse, the toll on Howluck's warriors was severe. Thirty lay lifeless and seven were taken captive. In contrast, Cook's, uh, or, I'm sorry, Crook's forces incurred a toll of one wounded and another mortally wounded. The battle, as noted by Crook, decisively put an end to further attacks from that particular band. So, the Snake War unfolded through peace talks between General Crook and Snake Chief Wawewa. Uh, Despite the profound impact, the Snake War languished in relative obscurity uh, within the pages of United States history. The Paiute and Western Shoshone, lacking their martial renown of like the Apache or Comanche, failed to capture the attention of reporters during the conflict. Joe Wasson emerged as one of the few to document the war, but the nation, gripped by the American Civil War and its aftermath, remained kind of largely oblivious. Yet, despite its overshadowed status, the Snake War held a somber distinction. Statistically, it stood as the deadliest of the Indian Wars in the West, deadlier than the Battle of Little Bighorn, leaving a toll of 1,762 men killed, wounded, and captured on both sides. If you look at the Battle of Little Bighorn, who everybody on this channel has probably heard of, and people who don't even care about West, Wild West history have probably heard of, that battle, there was only 847 casualties as compared to the Snake War, which was 1,762. The Snake War uh, is obscure. I didn't know about it until I started researching, and I thought I was pretty well read on the events of the Wild West. But it does leave a mark on the Wild West, even though we don't see it. It allows more travel to the West, which connects um, connects the eastern part of the United States to the western part of the United States, and all the drama that unfolded in between. <laughs>